The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. Some of these examples of dispute resolution have involved self-proclaimed maritime democracies, defenders of the rules-based order who are susceptible to those sorts of legitimacy claims that smaller states and their advocates have been making. But for China, it has resisted efforts to use international tribunals to try to resolve some of these issues. In this episode, aggression and arbitration, how countries in the Indo-Pacific manage maritime boundary disputes, from the South China Sea to the Bay of Bengal. Here to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. There is perhaps no greater maritime boundary dispute in our region than the competing claims to the South China Sea, led by China, which has become increasingly assertive with its territorial ambitions. In return, the United States has led the pushback, citing the imperative of maintaining freedom of navigation in contested waters. And of course, while China asserts its right to some 90% of the South China Sea, its claims variously overlap and conflict with those of Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei and the Philippines, all nations which are no strangers to maritime disputes. In fact, countries across the Indo-Pacific have had to find ways of resolving or at least learning to live with disputed maritime borders. So how have nations chosen to handle maritime border disagreements? What are the options? What's worked? And how much power do international maritime treaties really have? And are there any lessons for the ongoing and apparently intractable situation in the South China Sea, where tensions over China's claims pose a real threat to peace and security? Joining me to examine maritime disputes in the Indo-Pacific region is maritime security expert Associate Professor Beck Stratting, who is also Director of La Trobe Asia at La Trobe University. Beck, good morning and welcome to Ear to Asia. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Let's start uh, with, as I said, what you would have to consider to be the most dominant uh, dispute in this region, certainly the one that makes the headlines the most, and that's the South China Sea and China's claims versus those of other nations. How is it that Beijing lays claim to a maritime boundary that's so far in part from its own shores and yet so close to the shores of others? Yes, certainly the South China Sea is the most consequential dispute across the Asia maritime area. And partly, I think that's because China does lay uh, this claim through its nine dash line to, as you point out in the introduction, around 90% of that South China Sea maritime area, uh, which really cuts into uh, the claims and entitlements of other coastal states in South Southeast Asia. And partly the reason why China uh, has made this claim is because it feels a sense of ownership over that area. And it's partly a defensive move. Uh, If you think about security and defence planners in Beijing uh, and they're looking out into the world, one of their concerns is that they might be uh, invaded through the seas. So it becomes a kind of security imperative to protect the near seas. And they include the South China Sea, but they also include uh, the East China Sea uh, as well as well as the the Taiwan Strait. But the South China Sea really, this nine-dash line claim emerges from uh, some maps from the the late 1940s uh, after World War II. It was actually the Republic of China, what we call generally called Taiwan, produced this map. But the claims are actually pretty ambiguous. And it was in 2009 uh, when China attached the map to a a note verbal at the UN 
protesting some claims that some of the Southeast Asian states had made to continental shelves, where we see China start to use this nine-dash line in order to make sovereignty and maritime claims to this maritime area. But it really isn't quite clear what China is actually claiming by using the nine dash line. There are a number of interpretations that one can make. Uh, one is that it symbolizes that China owns the land features within this area. So the South China Sea is a maritime area, but it's dotted with hundreds of islands and rocks and low-lying features. And so one interpretation uh, is that the Nine Dash Line symbolises that China lays sovereignty claims over these features. A second interpretation is that, as you uh, point out, earlier that it's a maritime boundary. So it's not just that China lays claims to the sovereignty of the land features, but it sees that it has sovereignty and sovereign rights uh, within this area. So it has entitlements uh, to things like resources in the water column, as well as uh, resources under the seabed like oil and gas. There's also a third interpretation, which is that the nine dash line symbolizes China's sovereignty claim over the entirety of that area. Uh, and so that is quite a problematic claim under international law. I mean, the nine dash line, regardless, does not conform with the primary uh, international legal treaty governing maritime affairs, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. But this third interpretation that China potentially is uh, laying claim to sovereignty over the entirety of that maritime area uh, really undermines one of the core principles uh, in international law of the sea, that idea that maritime areas are not subject to sovereign appropriation. So the vast uh, amount of the world's oceans and seas are maritime commons. They can't actually be owned by one state uh, like land can. So that interpretation, that idea that China perhaps wants sovereignty over that whole area is really quite problematic uh, under international law, but it often uses sort of quasi-legal language to try to convince others that this nine-dash line claim is legitimate under international law. But very few states, I think, really recognise the claims that China makes in that area. At the same time, Beck, when you go back to that issue of maritime versus territorial boundaries, China's really sought to reinforce its claims by developing many of those uh, features in the South China Sea. You know, rocky art crops and, and sandy shoals in some cases have become full-blown islands, sometimes even with military facilities and landing strips. To what extent does that change that balance between something just being a maritime boundary and something attracting some sort of territorial right? That's uh, an excellent question, Ali, and that's really uh, what I've been calling in my work this process of territorialization. So there is a difference uh, in international law between the land and the sea. As I stated before, you know, the, the maritime areas, a lot of it is considered to be high seas, so it doesn't fall under the jurisdiction of uh, any particular state. Beyond a 12 nautical mile territorial sea uh, that states can claim off their coasts, uh, really coastal state rights are, are limited under international law. There is the exclusive economic zone area where states have um, limited sort of economic rights to things like fishing, but essentially international law treats the sea differently from how it treats land. But China's efforts to build artificial islands and to militarise those islands, uh, in my view, is a form of trying to territorialise what has been maritime space. Now, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS as we call it, is quite clear that artificial islands do not generate maritime entitlements. So uh, if a state like China builds uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea by dredging up sand and coral and, and all sorts of other sort of natural material, then 
under the international law of the sea, that doesn't mean that that state then gets a right to claim a territorial sea around that artificial island or an exclusive economic zone, an EEZ around that island either. But this is just one process or one way in which China uh, is seeking to extend control over that area. So certainly building up land is one form of territorialization. Another really important form of territorialization that China has uh, promoted in the South China Sea is by trying to extend domestic law, by saying that this area, what it tends to call as jurisdictional waters, which doesn't really have a, a clear meaning under international law, but what it calls its jurisdictional waters is subject to domestic law and that this it prioritises this ahead of international law. So, uh, for example, through the use of domestic laws, it tries to put limits on what navigating states uh, can do within the South China Sea. So it wants other states to get prior authorization for transiting through its territorial sea in a way that international law actually allows for states to do this freely without authorization or without notification through a, a principle called innocent passage. So China tries to use uh, domestic law in a way to exert control over that space. But what that does is it prevents other states from accessing their entitlements and their rights uh, through international law. And it also undermines this kind of key concept of freedom of the seas. Yeah, and this goes, doesn't it, to, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, that America is leading the pushback and it largely leads the pushback through these freedom of navigation exercises, which China uh, doesn't like and uses the sorts of what you've just been talking about to argue against them. Can you tell us a little bit about the purpose of those exercises and whether they are achieving what they're aimed at achieving? Yeah, so freedom of navigation operations are a, quite a US specific tactic uh, in order to try to protest excessive maritime claims. So the United States has this global freedom of navigation program. It doesn't just conduct phone ops against China uh, in the South China Sea. It actually conducts phone ops around the world against friend or foe. If a state uh, makes an excessive maritime claim in the eyes of the United States, then chances are the United States will try to protest that claim, essentially by transiting in a way that shores up how the United States interprets international law. Uh, so essentially using freedom of navigation operations in a customary way uh, to try to uphold the rules as the United States sees them. So the United States doesn't just use freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, but we have seen over the past 10 or 15 years a real increase in the number of freedom of navigation operations that the US is using in the South China Sea because of its concerns about the nature of China's claims and the ways that China is seeking to exert those claims. So we think about the South China Sea as a set of disputes. We have disputes over sovereignty, so different states claiming uh, different bits of land as being their own. You also have those maritime disputes, so disputes over maritime jurisdiction, you know, where exclusive economic zones begin and end, for example. But then on top of that, you have this layer of geopolitics. So the South China Sea has become totemic, really, of China's efforts to undermine what the US and its uh, allies and partners call the rules-based order. So often in the strategic narratives of the US or Australia or Japan or other partner states, they'll refer to the South China Sea as this example of how China doesn't respect the existing rules, uh, the existing laws that attempt to create and establish maritime order. And the South China Sea is that real key example of that. But we have to remember 
that the United States isn't a claimant state. It doesn't make sovereignty claims in the South China Sea. It doesn't have any maritime boundary disputes in the South China Sea. It's really interested in what the South China Sea says about China as a great power, China as a as a rising great power, and how it might seek to revise some of the key precepts of regional and international order, which the United States has, you know, played a significant role in creating, although itself doesn't always abide by either. And it's an interesting element of all of this that while the United States has this program designed to contest excessive maritime claims, and presents itself as a bit of an arbiter on some of these issues, uh, it itself has not ratified UNCLOS. So that can present a bit of a legitimacy issue for the United States because China can say, well, at least uh, China has has signed up to UNCLOS, which is uh, the constitution for the oceans. So let, let's look at UNCLOS at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And as you've pointed out, the US hasn't ratified it. And in fact, the, the one time that China's claims in the South China Sea were tested, they were tested by the Philippines and they were tested uh, under UNCLOS, a tribunal constituted under UNCLOS. And the Philippines won, Beijing lost, but it made absolutely no difference because Beijing didn't acknowledge the outcome. That's right. So the 2016 Arbitral Tribunal uh, ruling mostly agreed with the Philippines' interpretation and it did delegitimise that historic rights claim that China makes within the Nine Dash Line. So uh, the ruling effectively said that there is no real legal basis for the Nine Dash Line, uh, but China didn't participate in the Arbitral Tribunal process. It didn't recognise the Arbitral Tribunal tribunal process as being legitimate under UNCLOS. Uh, There is a reason for that, and and that is uh, that China had excluded itself from compulsory maritime boundary dispute resolution processes, which is a legal thing for states to do. UNCLOS does allow for states to exclude themselves from those processes. In fact, Australia has excluded itself from those processes, which made it impossible for Timor-Leste to take Australia to court on the, the, the specific issue of maritime boundaries in the Timor Sea. But going back to the original point, I mean, China didn't see the arbitral tribunal process as being legitimate. It didn't see the ruling as being legitimate either. So what does that, Beck, what does that mean, I guess, for the power of treaties like UNCLOS when you can remove yourself and and where you can ignore outcomes or there doesn't seem to be any obvious enforcement of outcomes. And I'll come back to the Timor Sea example um, a little later in our conversation, but what does it mean for just how credible those treaties are? Yeah, it's a really important question. And the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, I think we have to acknowledge from the outset, was a remarkable achievement. So this was uh, signed or agreed upon in 1982. It was ratified uh, in 1994. It's one of the most comprehensive treaties in international law in the sense that most states have signed up to UNCLOS. And this gives it some legitimating force as an instrument of international law. But the problem is, is that in order to get to this agreement where states have to negotiate and then sign themselves up uh, to be bound by the rules in, in a treaty like UNCLOS, there has to be compromises. And so the, the exclusion rule that, that the right of states to exclude themselves specifically on maritime boundary disputes is an example of a compromise that is made in order to be able to get the treaty across the line in the first place. So in the South China Sea, it's clear 
that China has been able to change the facts on the ground through things like artificial island building, through militarization, uh, which Beijing promised that it wouldn't do, but it did anyway. Uh, it has also been able to try and enforce its claims through the use of a militarized coast guard uh, and through the use of fishing vessels, what's called a, a maritime militia to, you know, to harass other fishers and to really fill up maritime space. So China has been able to quite assertively and, and aggressively in some cases uh, stake its claim in the South China Sea without there being too much pushback. I mean, phone ops haven't really altered China's ability to do that, to uh, implement this kind of salami slicing strategy, as they call it. You know, China has incrementally changed the strategic picture in the South China Sea in a way that the US and other states weren't really able to, to challenge. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is just a kind of weak treaty. It's not able to change anything. I mean, the first thing that I would say is that China often Often tries to legitimate its claims using UNCLOS as well. And it tries to delegitimize what the United States does by pointing out that the US hasn't um, signed UNCLOS. So great powers are concerned about reputation as much as smaller and middle powers are, but it doesn't necessarily stop them from making unilateral actions if they think that they can get away with it. The second point that I would make is that the South China Sea disputes, it is, you know, taken as the key example of one of the weaknesses of international law, but there's lots of examples where UNCLOS has actually assisted in resolving disputes. Over the long run, it's clarified boundaries, it's assisted smaller and middle power states in being able to access marine resources and entitlements within this 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone if they're able to claim that far out. Uh, and so that has has had a net positive effect on states uh, that otherwise might have struggled to access those entitlements if there weren't rules and laws in place. What about other claimants? Because, as I said, the, the claim of China in the South China Sea does overlap and intersect with the claims of a number, a number of other nations, and indeed they themselves uh, compete. So how have they sought to resolve those differences or have other nations essentially put those differences to one side while they wait for the China claim to in some way be resolved? The first thing I would say to that is um, that the Southeast Asian states that have sovereignty and maritime disputes with China, they tend to have different approaches themselves to how they, they manage their disputes with China. So if we think about the Philippines uh, took China to an arbitral tribunal, it didn't make a strong deal out of the, the successful ruling under the Duterte government, which was a bit of a shame. But, you know, it used uh, an international maritime dispute resolution process to try to resolve that dispute. Uh, Vietnam, there's been rumours swirling that Vietnam uh, might also try to resolve or to manage some of its issues with China uh, using an international court or arbitration process, but we have yet to really see that. Because, in fact, China actually put an oil rig inside Vietnam's claimed uh, economic exclusion zone, didn't it? Yeah, so and, and that is probably the most historically the most testy of all of the sort of relationships on a bilateral level has been Vietnam and China, uh, I would say. You know, there have actually been skirmishes. There have been contests. Uh, so in 1988, for example, that have, you know, led to actual conflict. So these are not small issues we're talking about, particularly between China and Vietnam. And Vietnam uh, is very good at trying to internationalise the dispute, so trying to bring other states in so that they're invested in a maritime order that's supported by UNCLOS in the South China Sea. You see 
a much more cautious approach when we think about Malaysia. You know, Malaysia does try to push back against China in in some of its rhetoric, but has been uh, more cautious than the Philippines and Vietnam in doing that, much more of a hedging approach on, on issues to do with the South China Sea. Brunei is very quiet because it has a quite a strong relationship uh, with China. And then you have Indonesia, uh, which claims to not be a party in the dispute, even though there have been these contests over the seas around the North Natuna, which is in that south part of the South China Sea and in which China's nine dash line does overlap with Indonesia's claim. It wants to see itself more as, a, I guess, a broker of being, you know, potentially leading the way in finding a solution to managing these disputes. So I should point out that, you know, there's sort of two key issues when it comes to the South China Sea issues and how they're dealt with by Southeast Asia and China. Uh, and that is, you know, whether or not they're trying to manage the dispute or whether or not they're trying to resolve the disputes. Resolving them is probably, you know, that's quite a difficult task. Uh, So at the moment, these states are focused on managing the disputes, so making sure that they don't escalate, making sure that, that the states are aware of some of the kind of dangers in in making provocative manoeuvres or doing things that other states might not like. So the code of conduct uh, is currently being uh, negotiated, but it's stalled due to COVID. And there's a lot of, I guess, scepticism among some about whether or not that's actually going to be a pathway for successfully managing those disputes. The states can't agree on a number of things. And, and that's, again, that's another issue, isn't it? Because because all these uh, Southeast Asian nation states, they're all members of ASEAN, which is where the negotiations are being undertaken for a code of conduct. But ASEAN works by consensus and by negotiation and essentially has made, is it too harsh to say no progress in trying to resolve competing claims in the South China Sea? I wouldn't say no progress. I think that watches of ASEAN. Some might see ASEAN as a talk shop, as something that's really hindered by, as you point out, the consensus decision-making model where all 10 ASEAN states have to agree. And that is a problem in the South China Sea because not all uh, ASEAN states have maritime or sovereignty disputes in the South China Sea, and they've all got very different relationships with China. So when you've got a model based on all 10 states having to agree, that becomes quite problematic. Uh, in this particular area. But then there are others who would argue that the process of talking uh, itself is part of the ASEAN way and that as long as these issues are being discussed, uh, there might be pathways to at least lowering the temperature on some of these disputes. And then, of course, the other issue, going back to your earlier question, is that there are disputes between Southeast Asian states. Now, when we think about maritime disputes in Southeast Asia, the South China Sea is the big one, uh, but there are some ongoing maritime disputes between, say, for example, one between Singapore and Malaysia uh, that sort of props up every now and then. You've got Singapore's land reclamation activities, which are causing a bit of anxiety to Malaysia, and, and, and this dispute has led to sort of tit-for-tat diplomatic protests that crop up every now and again. There are other examples that we could point to in in Southeast Asia uh, where there aren't clear maritime boundaries, that these have yet to be decided upon. Uh, But these disputes are very different from uh, what China's doing with the Nine Dash Line. China's Nine Dash Line is now, we can see after the 2016 Arbitral Tribunal ruling, it's a clear violation of UNCLOS, whereas uh, a lot of what's going on in in Southeast Asia between ASEAN states uh, over maritime boundaries uh, is kind of a result of historic legacies. And there's actually been a number of positive stories uh, around how these states have used either bilateral negotiations or used maritime dispute resolution processes under international law to try to resolve some of these differences. 
You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore, and I'm joined by maritime security expert, Associate Professor Beck Stratting. We're discussing maritime disputes in the Indo-Pacific. So, Beck, let's go back to some of those uh, ongoing disputes and and positive stories, and we'll look at those that have been resolved or potentially resolved in a moment. But just in terms of ongoing, you mentioned Malaysia and Singapore, for example. How have they sought to resolve their disputes? Have have they used UNCLOS? What what sort of methods have, have they looked at? Yes. Yeah, so if, if we think about some of the, the issues that have arisen in maritime area between Malaysia and Singapore, there was a dispute over who owned Pedra Branca, which is, you know, a sort of set of rocks in the Strait of Singapore. And this is a sovereignty issue, but it's one that has ramifications for maritime area, maritime boundary. Um, so in 2008, uh, the International Court of Justice actually awarded Singapore sovereignty over Pedra Branca. Now, since then, Malaysia has sort of been a bit up and down on this ruling. Uh, it did file an application to have the case reopened on the basis of new historical records, which was then abandoned. But what we can take from this example is the fact that Malaysia and Singapore were willing to use an international court uh, in order to try to resolve this dispute, which is interesting because, you know, China is not willing to use uh, arbitration or courts to try to resolve these issues. Uh, There are other states uh, in the region that have been reluctant to, to use these mechanisms as well. But you also have, in this particular example, land reclamation activities uh, in 2018 and 2019, Malaysia issued a notice that it intended to extend its port limits into Singapore's territorial waters. And Singapore then responded by asking for clarification on where these port limits are. And this sort of, uh, as I called it before, this diplomatic tit for tat um, kind of went on for a few months. And when claims overlap, they can have an effect on how states uh, view their entitlements and, you know, how they might protest the moves of other states. Uh, But Southeast Asian states, I think, have been able to manage these issues better between themselves because they're perhaps not as high stakes as what the South China Sea disputes with China is and, and what the Nine Dash Line means. But, but also the point that you made earlier that in Southeast Asia, many of those claims come from complex geographies and historical realities more than any form of aggression or expansion. Exactly. We're not talking about some new set of claims that states are making to try to extend their jurisdiction or to extend their sovereign rights. These are, you know, often they are linked to colonial legacies, often particularly when we're thinking about sovereignty disputes. There are historical reasons why states don't necessarily agree on on who owns what. Um, There's a complex set of international law around, you know, territorial acquisition that governs sovereignty issues, because that's the other thing is the international law of the sea isn't supposed to be about sovereignty. It assumes that um, the ownership questions are settled. Clearly, the South China Sea, they are not settled. So uh, often the disputes in the maritime boundary issues might just be about maritime boundary. They might not necessarily be about sovereignty as well. Uh, whereas the nine dash line is what we might call a mixed dispute because you have those sovereignty 
and those maritime disputes all mixed in together, which just makes it very complicated. And it really does reflect the fact that the South China Sea is this complex geography, as you say. You've got coastal states, a number of coastal states that are kind of closed in together. It's a semi-enclosed sea and there are hundreds of these land features that dot it, which make it much more kind of complicated in how maritime claims are then distributed on the basis of land. And if we look at ongoing disputes and we move north, China, Japan and South Korea have got a number of ongoing disputes, haven't they? You've got Senkaku or Diayu, uh, Takashima or Dokdo. Uh, These are disputes that have been uh, sort of bubbling along for a very long time. Yeah, so Senkaku Dieo, the dispute that China and, and Japan have over those islands is one that, you know, does tend to get some discussion, not as much as the, the South China Sea, I wouldn't imagine, but um, that's an important set of disputes as well. And they, again, we're talking about, you know, a sovereignty dispute. Japan currently has possession over Senkaku. It administers Senkaku, but China uh, challenges that claim. And it does so by sending in ships, particularly Coast Guard, fishing vessels in and around the territorial uh, waters of Japan around Senkaku. So this has increased, particularly since 2012, when Japan made the move to nationalise those islands, which really changed the status quo. But you can see there's been this spike like uh, this increase in China sending these sorts of vessels in to try to pressure Japan. It's a sovereignty dispute, but it has distinct maritime implications as well. The other set of issues in the East China Sea, you have uh, Dr. Takashima, as you mentioned, uh, which South Korea is the, the, the sort of administers that set of rocks uh, at the minute, but Japan contests South Korea's sovereignty. I mean, that's an interesting one because there doesn't appear to be much material advantage in claiming those rocks, but rather what you have is a set of historical grievances, I suppose. And the doctor, particularly in South Korea, has become a symbol of of nationalism. If you walk into the National Museum in Seoul, one of the first things you see is this kind of big poster, cardboard cutout of doctor being presented. So uh, it's very clearly a sort of symbol Uh, an anti-colonial symbol within South Korea, and it's much more about those ideational factors rather than the material gains of owning or possessing Dr. Takashima. Uh, And then you have a variety of different continental shelf disputes or EEZ disputes between China, South Korea and Japan. And what tends to happen is that these states use different methods for coming up with their maritime boundaries, depending on what suits their interests. So again, you can go back to that question of international law. There's different ways in which states might use and abuse international law in order to try to defend their national interests. And there's another example of we're talking about ongoing disputes. Let's move from the East China Sea and we go all the way west and the Chagos Archipelago, British controlled, but it includes that uh, US military base on Diego Garcia. Can you tell us about the Chagos Archipelago? Yeah, and this is a really interesting set of disputes. You've got um, the United Kingdom that administers the Chagos Archipelago under its British Indian Ocean Territory. That's what they sort of call the administering area around those atolls in the Indian Ocean. They're very important to the UK because, as you mentioned, uh, they house Diego Garcia, which is one of the most important US military bases in the Indian Ocean region. The problem for the UK has been that Mauritius doesn't accept 
that the UK's sovereignty over Chagos Archipelago is legitimate. So Mauritius has been engaging in a number of legal and public diplomacy strategies to try to defend its claims to sovereignty over those islands. And it's been quite successful. One of the things that it did was around 2010, it took the UK to an international court, it lost, I think it was, on the issue of the UK's marine protected area that it had tried to establish around the Chagos Archipelago. And what Mauritius was trying to do was to contest the MPA to say that it wasn't valid and that it infringed Mauritius's rights under international law and under treaties that had been signed between the two countries. But really what it was trying to do was to try to pressure the UK on that issue of sovereignty. There was a uh, an advisory opinion offered by uh, the United Nations, which supported Mauritius's claim. And recently, so it would have been November 2022, the UK actually agreed to enter into negotiations with Mauritius around the sovereignty of uh, the Chagos Archipelago. So this is really interesting in the sense that you have this much smaller state trying to defend its interests by, you know, sort of criticising UK colonialism, by saying that the UK's ongoing claim to Chagos is invalid, it violates um, self-determination rights under international law, and doing this by basically employing an international public relations campaign to put pressure on the United Kingdom. And one of the most effective ways that it's done that is by calling out the UK as being an advocate of the rules-based order by effectively linking the issue to the South China Sea by saying, well, you know, the UK claims that it supports a rules-based order. How can the UK support a rules-based order uh, and condemn China for undermining the rules-based order when it itself is violating some of these core precepts in international law? Obviously, the the UK still claims sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago and it has a strong interest in maintaining its ownership over that due to those sort of strategic reasons, wanting to provide this lease to the United States, the Diego Garcia military base. Uh, But the fact that It was even moved to open negotiations suggests that Mauritius has been quite successful in that pressure campaign. If we look now at disputes that have, to a certain extent anyway, been resolved, and you mentioned yourself earlier, Australia and the Timor Sea, uh, tell us a bit about, I suppose, how far that got towards resolution and the method used. Yes, yeah, so that was a long running dispute between Australia uh, and Timor Leste around maritime resources. Basically, the, the principal part of the dispute is oil and gas. That's the, the simple kind of way of, uh, of understanding why these disputes uh, emerged is because uh, the Timor Sea in the, the area between Timor-Leste and Australia uh, is quite rich in hydrocarbon resources and that's created uh, a bunch of issues that existed before Timor-Leste even became independent in 2000. So uh, it was in 1989 when Australia and Indonesia signed a joint development agreement in the Timor Sea to try to exploit the resources within what was called the Timor Gap this space between Timor and and Australia. The reason why this maritime boundary issue emerged and why joint development was seen as necessary rather than just kind of putting a line in the sea uh, is because both states had different ideas about what methods should be used to delimit the borders. So Australia had this claim of natural prolongation, that its maritime boundary should be at the end of its uh, geomorphic shelf, its continental shelf, whereas Indonesia had argued that the boundary should actually be set according to principles of equidistance, so basically creating a median line. 
So what you get is essentially Australia saying the line should be much closer to Indonesia and giving Australia the bulk of those those oil and gas resources and Indonesia saying, no, wait a minute, the line should be closer to Australia and that's what's set out uh, in UNCLOS. And so those historical disputes carried forward when Timor-Leste became independent. And so in 2002, on the day of Timor-Leste's independence, uh, Australia and Timor-Leste signed uh, the Timor Sea Treaty, which was basically an, an agreement to of joint development. So they agreed to put aside the issue of maritime boundaries uh, in order to be able to exploit the resources together. But that was not ultimately a sort of satisfying resolution for Timor-Leste. And there was this other gas field you know, predicted to be quite lucrative called Greater Sunrise that wasn't covered by the Timor Sea Treaty. And there have been you know, a series of negotiations uh, around who gets to possess that field, who gets to decide how it's exploited, uh, and who gets the, the upstream revenues from that. So, you know, often it's not just about digging the oil and gas up and selling it off. It's It can be about how it's processed can be quite lucrative for, for states. So with the resolution of this dispute, it was quite long running. Ultimately, Timor-Leste used the world's first United Nations compulsory conciliation process under UNCLOS. And while Australia had sought to avoid going to a court on maritime boundary issues, the United Nations at compulsory conciliation decided that it was competent to hear this case. And so Australia, even though it protested it, didn't initially want to be involved, uh, it did end up engaging in the process in good faith. And it really functioned as a facilitated bilateral negotiation. So it wasn't as if there'd be a court or an arbitration hearing the case, hearing the facts, and then making a decision. It was more like the two states had to get together in a room and find a novel solution for these protracted issues around maritime boundaries, which Timor-Leste from 2007 were really keen to settle boundaries rather than and leaving them up in the air and really wanted to enact their own plan for how the Greater Sunrise Resource would be developed. So you get a maritime boundary treaty in 2018 as a as a result of this world first process. And again, like the Chagos case, it was really down to the fact that there was a lot of pressure being placed on Australia. The civil society activists and Timorese politicians and people within Australia were arguing if Australia is going to be complaining about China's actions in the South China Sea, if Australia is going to be talking about the rules-based order, then it needs to conform to it as well. Uh, And that was quite uh, an effective strategy uh, and it really forced, I think, Australia to change its long-running position on whether or not maritime boundaries should be settled in the Timor Sea. I mean, if you describe that as as the need to look for a novel solution, there's another example where more innovative solutions have been used, and that's going now to the Bay of Bengal. Tell us about India and Bangladesh and how they resolved one of their disputes. Yeah, so there was a a long-running dispute in the Bay of Bengal between Bangladesh and India, which was uh, also recently resolved through the use of an arbitral tribunal. So Bangladesh initiated this proceeding and India had a bit of a wait and see approach to the whole thing before deciding that it would engage in this process in good faith as well. But what's really interesting about this, I mean, there was this novel solution uh, that was found in mapping out the maritime boundary. The arbitral tribunal created this kind of justification for how it would settle boundaries in a way that was quite creative in the same way that the Timor Sea boundary that was ultimately settled was quite creative. 
there isn't necessarily a template for it in UNCLOS, but as long as the states agree to it, then that's what matters. Uh, and so there was this sort of novel solution found to where the boundary uh, might lie. Bangladesh was able to secure quite a significant increase in uh, maritime jurisdiction out of this process. But the really interesting thing about this case is that India was able to use its participation in this arbitral tribunal process as a way of distinguishing itself from what China is doing in the South China Sea. So in all three of these cases where you have smaller powers trying to shape the interests of bigger powers in order to secure their own interests, in all three of these cases, Timor, Chagos and the Bay of Bengal, they were all linked in some way to South China Sea in the narratives around those cases. And India presented itself as a regional leader. So it was able to demonstrate its leadership credentials by saying, well, we engaged uh, in good faith in this process in contrast to China, which has ignored the arbitral tribunal ruling. So uh, again, you have that sense in which the geopolitics uh, around maritime disputes, what's going on in the South China Sea is a symbol for destabilising the rules based daughter actually has an impact on how other disputes are being resolved, which is kind of a bit counterintuitive. We think of the South China Sea as being this sort of destabilizing region, but it has had, you could say, a positive effect on how other maritime disputes have been resolved. But is there any indication that in turn the resolution of those other disputes will in some way provide lessons back to the issues in the South China Sea? Ah, see, that's a much more difficult question. And as I've argued in my research before, narratives like the rules-based order, the states that use those narratives are more likely to find themselves having to conform with those narratives than the targets of the rules-based order, which of course is China when we think about uh, Indo-Pacific. So China, I think in the South China Sea, it's a different case. So some of these other examples of dispute resolution have involved self-proclaimed maritime democracies, defenders of the rules-based order who are susceptible to those sorts of legitimacy claims that smaller states and their advocates have been making. But for China, I think it's been less susceptible. It does use lawfare strategies. So it does try to use uh, existing international law to its own advantage through kind of the use of abuse of law through strategic narratives. But ultimately, it has resisted efforts to use international courts and tribunals to try to resolve some of these issues. So the first problem is that you've got a kind of an authoritarian state that sees the South China Sea in a very particular way as it's near sea and it really is trying to territorialise that sea and to assert much more control over that sea uh, and it has a special place in China's strategic imagination which makes dispute resolution prospects quite difficult. The second set of issues is that they don't just involve two states they involve a number of states. They are mixed in that they involve sovereignty and maritime issues. When you think about the Timor Sea, for example, it's much more straightforward. You have two states. You could say that Indonesia was an interested party too in, in a lesser extent, but essentially you've got two states and it's a maritime boundary issue. There was no sovereignty issue. So you don't have the same sort of complexity as what you get with the South China Sea where you have multiple coastal states and you have this, you know, great power who is really asserting its claims and its interests in quite aggressive ways. But given that, to finish this podcast where we started, what is the hope is there any hope for a resolution in the South China Sea or indeed is the best hope the status quo? I think resolution is probably a way off 
I think what the states are focusing on is the management of those disputes. And if states in the region and and even beyond the region, so the United States as well, if they can come up with some agreements around code of conduct or around things like freedom of navigation, how it's interpreted, uh, if they can come up with some better strategies, confidence building measures, for example, for dealing with uh, or managing these issues, I think that's about as good as we can hope for at this stage. It doesn't look to me like resolving these disputes is going to come about anytime soon. Uh, But what needs to happen is really, you know, lowering the temperature around these disputes and and making sure that they don't lead to unintended incidents at sea, that they don't lead to, you know, flaring up of conflict uh, accidentally, and that um, Southeast Asian states, that they are able to access their rights under international law. Are you optimistic? Uh, You've looked at this area for a very long time. Are you optimistic about the ability to manage these disputes? In the end, boils down to China, doesn't it? Yes, it does boil down to China, but China's not going to get into a fight by itself. So um, I think it's going to be less likely to be Southeast Asian states wanting to get into direct fights with China. I think, to be honest, If we're thinking about it in terms of conflict and the likelihood of conflict, um, particularly great power conflict, I'm much more worried about Taiwan and more worried about Senkaku DAO than I am about the South China Sea as being a site of potential great power conflict. That's not particularly optimistic, I know, um, but it's just that I think the risk factors are greater elsewhere. Well, that, of course, is uh, probably another two podcasts worth of discussion there. Exactly. Beck Beck Stratting, (laughs) thank you so much for your time and your insights and for talking to Ear to Asia. Thank you so much for having me. Our guest has been Associate Professor Beck Stratting from La Trobe University. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put a good word in for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 26th of April, 20. 2023. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.